We're going to now have a look at inverse functions. We touched on it last year, you might remember. Uh, so hopefully you remember a bit of it from last year, but if you don't, it doesn't matter because we're going right back to scratch. So what is an inverse function? Well, we know, of course, what a function is, I hope. But to remind us, there's our definition of a function. So for every x in the domain, there's a maximum of one y value. And we can use our, our vertical line tests and slide along and, and, and use that. Now, if we swap and the x and the y around, so instead of becoming y equals function x, is now x equals function y. Now, at this stage, it's just a relation. So there's an example. So if our original function y equals x cubed plus x, its inverse relation would be x equals y cubed plus y. The question is whether or not that is an inverse function. So it's an inverse relation once we swap the x and the y, but it won't be an inverse function unless the new thing satisfies all the rules for a function as well. So in the new relation, if it basically satisfies the uh, definition of a function, so for every x value in the domain, maximum one and y value, then we call it the inverse function. So we have to start with a function. Swap the x and the y's around, we get an inverse relation. If that relation satisfies the rules for a function, then we can call it an inverse function. The symbol we use, you'll notice, is the, the negative one. The negative one symbol. So it's not reciprocal. So a function and its inverse, if you were to draw them both on the same graph, then you would see them, basically they're reflections of each other in the line y equals x. So if AB is a point on the original function, then BA would be a point on the inverse function. The x and the y's are swapping around. Uh, the domain of the original function becomes the range of the inverse function. Again, the x and the y's are swapping around. The range of the original function is the domain of the new function. Once again, x and y's swapping around. So how do we tell if it does indeed have an inverse function? Well, if we used a vertical line test to test to see if it is a function, we can use a horizontal line test to see if the inverse relation will be an inverse function. Okay. And basically, same rules. If it cuts it twice, then no. It'll be an inverse relation, not an inverse function. So our basic parabola. There's y equals x squared. Now, whoop. There we go, draw in a horizontal line and we can see it. It cuts it twice, so no. Y equals x squared does not have an inverse function. It would have an inverse relation. Whereas, say, our cubic, doesn't matter where I draw the horizontal line with the cubic, it'll only cut it once. So yes, that one would have an inverse function. The other way of doing it is algebraically, and that is if you actually swap the x and the y's around and try to make y the subject. And if you get an answer that's unique, so there's only one possibility, then it's an inverse function. So doing that with our parabola, swap the x and the y's round, I've got x equals y squared. But if I want to make y the subject, we go, well, y equals plus or minus the square root of x. So I've got two possibilities. So no, no good. It's not unique, so it's, it's not an inverse function. Whereas our cubic, x equals y cubed, well then we'd say y equals the cube root of x. And we're only dealing with real numbers, of course. So, yes, there is only one answer. So that one is unique. It has an inverse function. Now, the other thing we should see, inverses always cancel out. So that's why when you're solving equations, you always do the opposite. You want to undo the multiplication, you divide. You want to undo the addition, you subtract. If you want to undo the log, you exponentialize, if that is a word. But you're basically doing the inverse. So what should happen is if you substitute the function into the inverse function, they should cancel each other out and you're left with x. And the reverse should be true as well. If you substitute the inverse into the original function, again, they should cancel each other out and leave yourself with x. So looking at this one, uh, which is basically a hyperbola, well, swap the x and the y's round, and I'll make y the subject. Eventually I get there. There is the inverse function. It does turn out to be an inverse function. 
So 3x minus 1 on 2x plus 2. Okay, if I substitute the function into the inverse, so everywhere I see x, I've replaced it with um, 2x plus 1 on 3 minus 2x. I've substituted the original function into the inverse. So there's a bit of algebra manipulation to do, but fortunately the denominators are the same. But eventually, there we go, we get there, and yes, x is the answer. And let's just do the reverse to prove that one works as well. So if I go the other way, if I substitute my inverse into the original function, once again, yes, it does turn out to be x. So they are the inverse of each other. Well, when you think about it, most functions won't have inverses. Yeah, because most of the functions we look at, a lot of them are polynomials, and our polynomials go up and down. As soon as it's got a turning point, and comes back down or goes back up, it's going to fail the horizontal line test. Think of all our trig curves. They all go up and down. and that. They'll always fail the horizontal line test. Right? So most of the functions will fail the, the horizontal line test, which makes inverse functions pretty useless. Unless we do something, and that's why we restrict the domain of the original function. So if the original function doesn't have an inverse, what we'll do is we say, well, okay, I'm not going to look at the whole curve. I'm just going to look at a piece of it. And just a piece that then will have an inverse. So we restrict the domain. Now, when you want to restrict the domain, you want to try and get all of the range if you can. If you can't, you want to get as much as possible. I always try and uh, get zero in there, the origin, if I can. And if I've got a choice to make, I'll, I'll tend to go with the, the positives rather than the negatives. So let's have a look at y equals x cubed. Well, y equals x cubed is okay, if you remember. It already had uh, an inverse function, so we don't have to restrict the domain on this one. So here's y equals x cubed. We know its domain is all real x. We know its range is all real y. So working out the inverse, swap the x and the y around, we make y the subject. Uh, x to the power of a third, or the cube root of x, and look what happens. And I'm now looking at this and thinking, pretty bad example. The domain swaps with the range, and the range swaps with the domain. See, look, look, the domain was all real x, and the range of the new one's now all real y, and uh, yeah, bad example to pick, hey? To demonstrate how the domain and the range, they have actually swapped over. Okay, they happen to be the same thing in this one, but there you go. There's y equals x. If I was to draw, leave it, there it is, woo. Y equals x to the power of a third, and you'll notice how it has its, the symmetry around y equals x. And if you're not sure, tilt your head 45 degrees, and you'll go, oh yeah, look at that. Let's have a look at our exponential curve. So y equals e to the power of x. And there it is, y equals e to the power of x. Now this one I suppose will illustrate a little bit better how the domain and the range swap over. The domain is all real x, the range is y is greater than zero. Um, you'll recall that the logarithm is the inverse of the exponential. So if x equals e to the power of y, y will end up being log x. The domain of a log curve we know is x is greater than zero. Now we can see how the range of the original function has become the domain of the inverse and the range of a log curve is all real y. So the domain of the original function has become the range of the inverse. And if we were to draw that one, there we go, y equals log x. There is no point of intersection of those two curves. All right, well what about when we have to restrict it? y equals x squared. It fails our horizontal line test, so it's no good. So at this stage, the domain is all real x, and the range is y is greater than or equal to zero, and it fails, it doesn't have an inverse. So I want to restrict the domain on this parabola. I want to get as much as that range, so I want to get a piece of the curve where y will always be greater than or equal to zero, and hopefully it will be all the values greater than or equal to zero. And I guess I've got two choices. I could restrict it to be x is greater than or equal to zero, or I could restrict it to be x is less than or equal to zero. I'm gonna go with the positives. So I'm now just looking at the right-hand side of the curve. So it's like the left-hand side doesn't exist. And if that's the case, it will satisfy the horizontal line test. 
So the range is now still y is greater than or equal to zero. Hasn't changed. So now I can swap them around and I get y equals x to the power of a half. But notice it's no longer plus or minus the square root of x because I've restricted it. So the domain of my inverse, x is greater than or equal to zero. The range is y is greater than or equal to zero. Basically what we're talking about, if I draw it in, is the top half of the parabola on its side. And you might recall we mentioned that way back last year when we were looking at functions, how the parabola on its side was actually two functions, the positive square root and the negative square root. So I've chosen the positive square root for my inverse here. It also explains why when you go to your calculator and you press the square root button, it always gives you the positive answer. Yeah. Because your calculator is working with the actual function, the inverse function. Well, let's have a look at the HSC question. So they've given us the good old bell-shaped curve, uh, e to the minus x squared. The graph has two points of inflection. Find the x-coordinates of these points. Oh, okay, well, a bit of calculus. We know possible inflection points occur when the second derivative is equal to zero. So I get minus 2x is e to the minus x squared for the first derivative. There's my second derivative. Solve that, I get x equals plus or minus 1 on root 2. Now, normally, I would have to go and check and make sure they are inflection points. For this question, I don't. Why? That's it. They've told us it has two points of inflection. We've found a total of two possibilities. Therefore, I've found them. Now, if I'd come up with three solutions, okay, then I've got to check and see which two are the points of inflection. But they've told me there's two, I've found two, so logic tells me that they must be the x-coordinates of the two points of inflection. Explain why the domain must be restricted if it is to have an inverse function. Well, what did I say? Oh, <laughs> oh, I got real fancy. Here you go. In order to have an inverse function, there must exist a one-to-one -one relationship. That just basically means for every x value there's one y value or so. In other words, every value in the domain is a unique value in the range. So that was my explanation. I suppose you could say, um, because it fails horizontal line test. And they probably would have given you the mark for that as well. We're now going to find the inverse. They've told us to restrict for x is greater than or equal to zero. So if we swap the x and the y's around, and now I want to make y the subject. I'll be very careful here. So minus y squared is log x. So y squared is minus log x. I don't like that negative hanging around, so I'm going to put it inside the log function. So I've made it the log of 1 on x. And so therefore y is plus or minus the square root of the log of 1 on x. If they've restricted the original domain to be x is greater than or equal to 0, it means the range of my new function must be greater than or equal to 0. So therefore, I need the positive square root, not the negative square root. So y has got to be greater than or equal to zero. So there we have the square root of the log of one on x. State the domain of the inverse. Okay, the range of the original function will become the domain of the inverse. Now the original graph went between naught and one, but not including zero. So therefore, the domain of my new one will also go between 0 and 1, not including 0. And now they want us to sketch the inverse. Voila! So I've reflected the original curve, but in the line y equals x. That'll do us for today.